Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Our Father's Word, how fantastic it is. You know, the last chapter documented the crucifixion, the burial, and um, the resurrection. And this chapter is kind of written to, um, to those of God's elect, especially here in the end times. I'll document that in a moment as we come to chapter 54 the great book of Isaiah Isaiah meaning in the Hebrew tongue Yahweh's salvation that's God's way of salvation for you chapter 54 verse 1 and it reads um, with that word of wisdom from our father in Yeshua's name sing O barren thou that didst not bear break forth into singing and cry aloud that thou didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord." Now, this would be a little confusing to some if you did not understand that our Father is speaking spiritual here. He's speaking to those that He called before the foundations of this world, basically. And he's, this is why it was written in Mark 13, Woe to those that are with child when I return and those that give suck, meaning spiritually impregnated with the false Christ and actually nursing along his work. And, and um, those that remain barren, that's to say wait for the true husband. He even calls them wife and you know that he considers a wedding even from the first earth age. If you want to go that far, if you don't, put it on the shelf over here and reread chapter 19, verses 7 and 8 of the great book of Revelation. But our Father loves His children. And what He's saying here, sing and celebrate if you're one of those that didn't get drawn into the false marriage of the false Christ and His false teaching. And again, it's a blessing for a mother to conceive and bear a child. Always has been, always will be. As a matter of fact, God told people to replenish the earth way back in Genesis chapter 1. But spiritually speaking, it's a totally different connotation. You know, it should remind you of Christ's words as He was carrying that cross up the hill to Golgotha with the crown of thorns and the blood dripping. What did Christ say? The women were crying by the, by the um, path as He went up to that hill. And He was thinking of the generation that would wait for Him at His return. Listen to it. I'm going to read it to you. You won't have it. Luke chapter 23, verse 28. But Jesus, turning unto them, these daughters of Jerusalem, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. That's to say generation to generation. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps that never gave suck. In other words, that waited for the true Messiah. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. That's when they realized they worshiped the false Christ at the true Christ return. For if they do these things to a green tree, in other words, if they do this to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, when He's in the flesh and blood runs in His veins, what shall be done in the dry? What are they going to do with the Spirit? They're going to fall off and worship the Antichrist, most of them are. And what are they going to cry? I'm not a widow, I'm a queen. <clears throat> and old sister Babylon and all those that are deceived by the false Christ will give that cry. 
And guess what happens when the true Christ returns, just as he warned? <clears throat> Spiritually barren until the true husband returns. No marriage till then. Spiritually speaking. Verse 2 of uh, chapter 54, the great book of Isaiah, let's go with it. Enlarge the place of thy tent. This is the ones that are barren. And let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, and lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. In other words, you were barren, but you're going to be so blessed, and so many are going to be converted. You're going to have to enlarge that, <clears throat> your tent, and, and your house, in other words, because to hold them, there's going to be so many. And of course, naturally, when you look forward to that first day of the millennium, when Christ returns, every knee is going to bow to him, every knee. They won't stay that way, but they will when they realize they've been had. You do not want to be caught in that trap of not having studied God's Word to know the difference between the true and the false, your true husband and the fake. Verse 3, For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit, or to rule the Gentiles, that should be translated nations, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. In other words, um, the nations are going to come forth. Again, every knee bowing to the true Messiah, King of kings, Lord of lords, the only government there will be at that time. Verse 4, fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, you're not going to be praying for mountains to fall on you. You stay true. Neither be thou confounded. Don't you be confused. For thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. In other words, the fact that Christ was gone. And... and um, and this should remind you, and you should make a note of Revelation chapter 18, verse 7, where the old sister harlot, the, the uh, sister Babylon, says, I'm not a widow, I'm a queen. And the false Christ supports her, pays her bills, teaches her falsely, and she loves every minute of it. False religion, false teaching, it's a dangerous thing to go against the word of the living God. For God has forewarned us chapter by chapter, verse by verse, trump by trump, seal by seal, vial by vial, exactly how it goes down in the end times. And you have, have you ever read it? You know, anytime Christ was answered to ask a question, he would say, haven't you read? In other words, it's written, it's all right here. Why haven't you read it? <clears throat> so there you have it. Uh, so remain true to the true Father. Okay. Verse 5. Who do you remain true to? Let's read it in verse 5. For thy maker is thine husband. Well, who made you? Well, the living God did. He created your soul. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. In other words, he's the nearest kin you've got, and he's kinsman Redeemer. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. In other words, universal dominion. He picked Jerusalem. He, he wed her. He made a covenant with her in Ezekiel chapter 16. It's his favorite place, not only in the world, but the universe. And that's where he intends to establish the eternal heaven. And he shall return. The full Godhead will not return de jure until the end of the millennium. But the Son returns on the first day of the millennium, which is called the Lord's Day. How long is the Lord's Day? Well, as it is written in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Be not ignorant of this thing, for one day with the Lord is as a thousand years with man. In other words, it's a thousand years, meaning the Lord's day is the millennium. It's that time of teaching. The time that many that have never had an opportunity to hear the truth, they're going to be taught. 
well, are you talking about a second chance with some, what's being taught by some people? Some of them don't have a prayer of a chance because they won't study on their own. They won't study for themselves. There shouldn't be any great mystery to that verse. Our husband is our maker. That's the true. Don't be sold a bill of goods and wed out of season and be spiritually impregnated, that means in your mind, by false teachings to worship the false Messiah. His message, I've come to fly you away. A lot of people are going to believe that. And that's real sad because they were forewarned in the Word of God exactly. Seal by seal, trump by trump, and vial by vial in the great book of Revelation, exactly line on line as to how it would go down. See that you, one of God's elect, those that he thought of as he was carrying that cross up to Golgotha, to Calvary, weep not for me, but weep for those that are, um, that, um, uh, are with child. Blessed are those that are barren, those that wait for me that wait for my return. Verse 7, I'm sorry, verse uh, 6. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, saith thy God. In other words, um, it, you may, this is the, during the great apostasy, you may feel you're abandoned if you're not careful. But if you know God's word, uh, you won't, you, you're wasting your time if you feel that way because God promises, I will never leave thee nor will I forsake thee. But for that one little period of time, the apostasy, that's, that's the falling away. That's when the false Christ returns and the world whores after him, okay, thinking he's the true Jesus, performing miracles in the sight of people, <clears throat> excuse me, that deceives the world. Boy, is he going to be accepted by those that are unlearned. But you're not unlearned. Do you know the Word of God? And you believe the Word of God, and you follow the Word of God. Verse 7, listen carefully. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. It may seem like I've abandoned you. In other words, he's got to give the false Christ that little bit of time. But that's when you shine. That's what your destiny is. As it is written in Mark 13, that's when you're delivered up and you allow the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the, the spirit he mentioned in, in Luke 23, what will they do with this, um, the uh, tree with the blood running in the vein? What will they do with my body and the spirit, the Holy Spirit? You're going to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. You're not going to whore around with the false Christ. And you will do exploits as it's written in the 11th chapter of the great book of Daniel simply standing your ground and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak. That's destiny, my friend. And what a privilege to serve the living God. Verse 8, in a little wrath, just a little bit of anger, God is saying, righteous indignation, I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer, the one that saves you, the one that redeems you over and over when you fall short. Why? He loves you. He's your Father. He is so very, very proud and, and shows kindness toward those that see the truth, that care, that want to please Him, that want to stand against the false one. The controversy is between Satan and Almighty God. Which side do you choose? Do you listen to the traditions of men that make void the word of God? Or do you listen to your father? The choice is yours. There, the, what he's saying is there may be 
seemingly to some just a little rough moment there, but hey, bring it on. We're, we're can-do type people. We can cut it. Why? Because we know that God has given us power as that same book of great Luke, St. Luke, in chapter 10, verse 18, he gave us power over all of our enemies in the name of Jesus Christ. So we don't have to worry about those things. We can cut it. We can get it done. And we will not disappoint the Father. And that brings many blessings. Do you know what his reward is for that? Not tomorrow, but today. Verse 9. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. This is your Father speaking. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. You can count on it. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 13, what did he promise? He gave us a sign. He said, every time you see it, remember that. It's a rainbow. Every time you see the rainbow, it's God's promise that he will never flood this earth with water again. Satan's going to try it. But every time you see a rainbow, it's a promise to you that God is never going to be angry or wroth with you, that He loves you, and He shows that kindness to you, and it is everlasting. You know, in hard times, you need to know this, and you need to never forget it, that it's a promise from God. And do you remember what he said back in chapter 43, verse 26? He said, hey, remind me of the promises I have made you and let's talk about it. Well, do that. That's, that's a condition. Remind him of the promises and talk to God about it. Talk to your father about it. But this, this is a powerful promise that he has made us. Us who? You that remain barren when the false Christ comes. You that will not be taken in by a false Messiah, but will love the living God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and spirit to love He that will never forsake you nor leave you. And every time you see that rainbow today, it's placed there as a promise from God that He will never flood the earth again, but also for you, the barren, spiritually speaking, you that stay true, that stay true to the seals, the trumps, and the vials. That's to say the Word of God. It's His promise that He'll never be angry with you. When God's tribulation comes and hailstones are falling on this earth, if you're right in the middle of it, you don't have to worry. He'll protect you. He'll guard you. You can count on it. It's His promise. And, and I'll, I'll use it again, just as the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were in that fiery furnace, Christ walked with them and they weren't singed. So it is for you in the fiery trials of, all the, of the end times of Satan's. You don't have to worry. God has given you the rainbow, the promise. Talk to him about it. Claim it. Verse 10. For the mountain shall depart. <clears throat> At the end, he's going to shake things up. And the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. That covenant is eternal. That covenant is everlasting. That promise that he made concerning the rainbow will always be. Remember it. Stay true. And never, I mean, even, uh, even when the tribulations and the shaking, you see, if you're on Christ, you're on a rock that can't be shaken anyway. So when the end comes, you don't have to worry. That's what he's saying here. Verse 11, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphires, 
He's quoting here from Revelation 21, 18, where he's talking about his election and how that he, that he brings all this in. Do you, you know what colors is in, in the Hebrew? It's makeup. I'm gonna, you're going to look good. And then we're not literally speaking that, in other words, it's going to be beautiful where you're at, spiritually speaking, all right? Even though he uses the word makeup here, um, uh, stibium. Okay. Verse 12, And I will make thy windows of agates, and thy gates of carbuncles, and all thy borders of pleasant stones. Again, you can read of this in that final chapter where the earth is rejuvenated and we go into that eternity in Revelation 21, 18. You want to be there or do you want to be in that other place? It's called the lake of fire. You don't want to be there. Verse 13, And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. You know when this happens? It's in the millennium. And a lot of people will say, well, I didn't know there would be any teaching in the millennium. Well, God says there will be. Why wouldn't you believe him? That's what it's about. You know, the traditions of men so make void the word of God that very few people even have the opportunity to hear the real word of God taught in this generation. They have removed him from the schools and they wonder why they have shootings of children shooting each other up in schools. You take God out of their environment. You know something? That's the only place many children even heard of God was prayers in school. And it set the morals and the standards in this nation. We didn't have school shootings back then. Well, weren't there guns? Yes, there were guns, but we had morals. We taught children morals. We don't do that anymore. And that's what you have. They will be taught in the millennium, discipline and order. Verse 14, in righteousness shall thou be established. You can, that doing what's right. Thou shalt be far from oppression. We're going to get rid of um, anxieties. For thou shalt not fear and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. In other words, there will be no terrorists there. They'll be somewhere else, okay? They surely won't be there. So you don't have to, this is a promise from God. You can count on it. Verse 15, behold, they shall surely gather together. They're going to come against you, but not by me. God said, I'm not the one that gathers them. Well, who is it? Satan, of course. Wickedness. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Why? Because God's with us. It, it, any weapon that is uh, brought against us will fall. It will fail. Why? Because God is with us. He promised it. He said it. I believe it. Our Father is faithful to those that truly Bring forth his word, the truth, unadulterated in the traditions of man, unvarnished with false teachings, but the pure, open truth. They, he says, what, what he's saying is, there'll be some people talk against you, but that's okay. I didn't bring them, but I'll take care of them. That's what he's saying. And indeed he shall. Verse 16. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. Do you understand that God is saying, I created the waster to destroy? He's saying, I created Satan. Well, of course he did. He created everything. Satan went bad. And many people say, well, that kind of shakes me up. Well, no, you should, it shouldn't. What God is saying, I made it all. I'm in charge. I'm in control. There are certain things I will let him waste, and there is a line. It won't be you. I will prevent him if he comes against you. But 
What it does, it gives you the strength of your spiritual husband, which is God, the Redeemer and the Creator of all things, including the wicked. So if God owns their souls, his souls are his are his soul, their souls belong to God for God to do with as he chooses and sees right. And that's why the lake of fire will have company. Verse 17, listen carefully and learn from God's word. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Now, now I, I want you to absorb that. How many, how many of the weapons can prosper against us? No. Zero. Nada. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. It may waddle along, and it may look bad, but it's not going to prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. You can count on it. Now listen, I don't want you to read over something that was in that verse. Because many would say, did you hear that? Any tongue that rises against us, God's going to judge and do away with. That's not what it said. It's not what it said at all. Well, let's go back and see what it said. It said, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou, you, you shall condemn. So you see, it takes a little work on your part. Christ, in that great 10th chapter of the great book of St. Luke, in the 18th verse, as I forementioned in this, own, this same lecture, gave you power over all of your enemies. He says, you condemn them. And that's why you can boldly go forth and criticize and condemn those that would mock or come against the word of the living God. You don't, you have nothing to worry about, nothing, no weapon that goes against the very works of God concerning the end time that leads up to the millennium can prosper against God's elect, God's wife, those that, um, that God chose before the foundations of this world that he can trust, he knows them. Why? Because they stood against Satan in the first earth age. Only one third of the children fell off to Satan in the first earth age. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. You didn't if you're one of God's elect. Whereby Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 says, I chose you before the foundations of the earth. Meaning the word in the noun is katabo, the overthrow of Satan in the first earth age. I chose you then. Why, why, well, why would God choose you? Because you earned it. He doesn't give free rides. You earn it. So uh, this is a fantastic chapter, this 54th chapter. Christ remembered them when he was kept walking up that hill to Golgotha to pay the price. And the price he paid, we collect in the very next chapter, chapter 55. Chapter 55 is given by invitation for those that love him and those that truly do love him. And we thank our Father for that. Chapter 55, verse 1. Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Well, how is it that you can buy it without money? Because you have to know what kind of wine and milk he's talking about. The milk of grace, the wine, the blood of Christ that washes away all of your sins, and water, the living water that once you partake of it, which is to say Christ, the truth, you never thirst again. 
the reason you don't buy it with money is he paid the price on the cross. He, it, it's not free. It cost an awesome price. He that wore that crown of thorns, he that carried that cross, and he that said to the daughters of Jerusalem as he was going up to be crucified to pay this price, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. Blessed are those that are barren when he returns, of course. He's the one that paid the price. And when you recognize the fact that he did pay that price, then you know and understand that our Heavenly Father loves us, appreciates us, and certainly we uh, can share in that love and that understanding the fact that he would never, never uh, abandon us nor forsake us and that nothing that ever prosper, that w any weapon that comes against us would never prosper. This is by invitation. God has his election, but this is whomsoever will, meaning that will believe, that will know that he paid that price. Um, and uh, he th or she that has ears to hear. Verse 2, wherefore, wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me. You listen closely to me. And eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight. Not your body, but your soul delight itself in fatness. Uh, I don't know how many times have you gone to a church where you weren't fed, where it didn't satisfy. Why, why did you spend your money where it didn't satisfy? Where it just plunked. No truth there. No life. Truth comes from the living word. There is no substitute for the blood of Christ. There is no substitute for the truth. That truth is precious. That truth is the word of our father, our husband. I don't know. It is up to you as to which side you choose and whether you want freely that that he has paid for or if you want second-hand hand-me-downs from that will never satisfy, it's your choice. He sent you the letter. It's yours to read and accept. I hope you do. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, 1-800-643-4645. You know what? That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, individual, or religion, or denomination. Let's don't judge people. God's Word is sufficient unto itself. We have one judge, and that's our Father. It is your right to discern, spiritual discernment, but don't judge. Father doesn't appreciate that, but you teach God's word, you share it, and you let the chips fall wherever they may. Never, never apologize for the word of God. 
All right, those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. You got a prayer request, you don't need the number, and you don't need the mailing address. All, why? Because God, God knows what you're thinking even. You don't even have to say it out loud. He loves you. He may not love what you do always, but He does love you. Your soul belongs to Him as it is written in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. You can't get around to giving your soul to God. He already owns it. It's His to judge and do with as He chooses. Okay, So let Him know that you love Him. That's what He wants from you. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name, Father. Thank you. Amen, amen. Okay, question time. And we've got uh, Rose from Kentucky. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10, you teach the covering mentioned as hair is, a, is actually the covering of the Lord over the woman. I can see that. Well, yes, in the 10th verse it says because of the angels. And it means you better have Christ over you or the fallen angels will seduce you. That's what it means. Then please explain what Paul means about a man with long hair is a shame in verse 14, and for a woman it's her glory, verse 15. Well, for the same reason, if a man had to put Christ over his head to keep the angels from seducing him, it would be a perverted act. Okay, that's what it's talking about. Uh, Brianna from Arizona. When the devil is here playing Jesus, he, can, he can't hurt one hair on my head, but what about those who follow him? The flesh man, that is. Can they kill me? No weapon brought against you can prosper. This is why it is written in the great book of Matthew. If you pass, at that time, if you pass an adversary in the byway, agree with them. Don't argue with them. The byway could be a critical place at that time. Why? Well, you're... You are to witness before the spurious Messiah, not a street bum. Okay. So he says, agree with them. That means, hey, hey, that's all you got to say anymore or just grunt. It'll get you by in the street anymore. That's, that's intelligence to them. Okay. And go on about your business and do what God would have you do. Okay. Always be wiser than the serpent. Ray from Texas. Do those that have already passed on and are on the right side of the gulf in heaven have immortal or mortal souls? If they have immortal souls, what is the purpose of them going through the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium? Rewards? You, you don't really have a question. You're hitting it right on the, the nail, okay? Naturally, if they're on the right side of the gulf, they have immortal souls, meaning they made it. They, on them, the second resurrection and the second judgment has no, uh, the, uh, the, and the, has no effect. And naturally, we all, what's written in the book of life is your rewards. In other words, some people will have nothing but negative, negative, and they'll go to hell. But at the same time, we that have worked for our Father have, re, have uh, it is written, it's in the book. And we collect for that. That's reward. So you got it right on, okay? If they have mortal souls, would you please, it, it, they do not. The ones with mortal, mortal in the Greek tongue means liable to die. And if they're liable to die, it means they're liable to go to hell. So they go to the other side of the, um, the stream. Thank you for, and I, I thank God a lot frequently for his, this pastor. Well, thank you. You're so welcome. Uh, Wilda from New York. The Bible is or was the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What about Job's friends? All of the things they said to Job, were they inspired by the Holy Spirit? Have, have you never read chapter 38, verse 2? You need to. Job 38, verse 2. What does it say? God tells Job, get up from there. Why are you listening to these people that have no wisdom? 
So certainly the Holy Spirit didn't send them because there's no wisdom involved in them. A lot of people will, li what is God saying? Don't listen to ratchet jaws. That's the whole purpose. A lot of people don't know that, and you know, I've heard, I've heard preachers preach sermons on what those people with ratchet jaws said. The whole thing is based that the ratchet jaws knew that Job had to have sinned or God wouldn't have let, allowed what happened to him, but God is not the one that did to Job what ha that, that is to say that happened. Satan did. And um, uh, so Job knew he hadn't sinned. And all through 38 chapters, you sin, Job, it shows, or it shows, it shows. Ratchet, jaw, ratchet, jaw, ratchety, ratch. Okay, and finally, God just can't take it anymore. He said, what? Why don't you listen to me? So I would say the same thing to everybody today. Why would you want to listen to trans, uh, um, uh, men's words instead of reading God's letter? And paying it rightly, dividing the word to see who's speaking, if it's God, the Holy Spirit, or some ratchet jaw. God allows the ratchet jaws to speak in the word because you're supposed to know the difference. Well, how would I know the difference? He told you 38, Job 38, 2. Okay. And you know, for God to have let that gone on for 38 chapters, let you know how hard he knows it is for some people to learn. Okay, Chance from Texas, I have a question about the bronze snake. In the Ten Commandments, it says, do not make or worship idols, but in Numbers 21.8, God tells Moses um, to make a snake and put it on a pole, and the one who, anyone who is bitten can look on it and live. Why would God use a bronze, bronze statue to do his healing? Well, he was teaching a lesson. You gotta go back and why, in the first place, why did God bring the serpents on the people? They were murmuring. Picky, picky, gripey, gripey, gripey against God over and over, just nya, 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 nya. Finally, God got tired of it and he brought serpents in, they bit them and a bunch of them died. And then he told Moses, what, what, what does it mean when you put something on a stick and stake it? You conquered the snake, okay? It means you got victory over the serpent. And uh, Christ himself would make a statement at one time about you kind of have to look at this both ways. So the, the idea was is to teach people not to murmur, okay? And that we have victory over the snake, but at the same time, Christ was placed on a stake, a, a tree, that is, a cross, and we're healed by his blessings. Now, uh, there is a different teaching that you must be aware of. Is the Egyptians taught that the serpent was a healer. And quite frankly, many of you will see medical decals and you'll have these old twisted snakes on the the doctor's little healing pad because they taught that s snakes were healers, okay? And they could, if you know, if you were in misery, a snake can get you out of your misery pretty quick, okay? If, if they bite thee, you'll die, okay? And you won't have any more pain. So anyway, I, enough said on that, all right? But it, God's purpose was to show that he has victory over the serpent, which ultimately means Satan. He's got him on the pole and he's dead, okay? Gene from New York, I have a question to you. Is it not a sin to vote? I was told it is. I was also told that, well, this nation is a nation of the people, by the people, and for the people. And the way we maintain our power is to vote. The people maintain their power and what is right by voting. So yes, it is a sin not to vote, unless you're handicapped or something and just have no way of getting there, or don't know what you're doing, okay? But it's pretty simple to see who's right. And as Christ would always say, I can't tell people how to vote, but you should vote. That's the way we 
control our nation and keep things as they are. Patty from Kentucky. Uh, I have a problem. I don't get out of the house much because of my disabilities, but I do witness to my family and neighbors. I really have a hard time liking people. I prefer animals. Will God hold this against me? No, God loved his animals too. And there are some people it is pretty hard to love, all right. So you, you're, you're in good shape. Anybody that has compassion like that, you're, you're doing good. Merle from Texas. Do we just stay home and not vote we got in this national election or hold our nose and punch it? Well, uh, I, I can't, you know, as you know, we're a church and I can't tell people how to vote, but I can tell you to vote that you have to do, okay? Uh, choose, always choose right though. Uh, Jan from Texas. Jen, you are right, and um, you will get to see your son. Ezekiel 44, verse 25, documents it. That's, what, that's the millennium. You will see him, and don't be judging, okay? M Mikey from Alabama. How old were you when you were saved, and where all has God took you to get where you are today? Well, he took me a lot of places, okay? Uh, around the world, two, two wars, one world war, and one North uh, Korean War uh, in combat um, and um, through many trials and tribulations. But I was very fortunate that, that at a very young age, um, though I was of the world, that is to say in combat, that I knew there was a father and he led me into a deep study beginning at a very young age. And, um, and, and uh, that scholarship uh, has come forth and he has blessed me with um, a memory and the ability to teach. And uh, I think it pretty well, many might say, well, I didn't know you were much of a teacher. Well, a lot of people think I am. So I've either got them fooled or the father does. One of the, we've got the word of God down pretty good. I thank my father for the experience, the education, in the many places that he has taken me and in fighting for the freedom of this great nation, even to the point of shedding, shedding blood in North Korea for the freedom and the right to teach God's word openly and freely in this great nation. Uh, Doug from Georgia does not uh, um, does not uh, this mean that I, that I am necessarily being wise in everything I do or say, but it seems real, nearly impossible at times to be totally sure of what I do or say is within the bounds of God's wisdom. Have you ever had this problem and can you comment? I believe that an antiseptic approach to this problem would be much worse than going ahead and risking making a mistake or two along the way. What, what do you say? Well, you're, you're going to make mistakes when you live. Nobody's perfect. And if you're trying to set yourself up as perfect, you're never going to make it. And, and certainly um, God says, I, I, if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out. He'd rather you did something and learn, if nothing else, what you did wasn't right, so straighten up. Um, None of, uh, we, we will all make mistakes. That's why we have repentance. And never be afraid to live. You know, a lot of Christians, they get goody-goody two-shoes. And they're, they're even afraid to go near a sinner, afraid it'll rub off on them. Well, you're, I, I question one's faith and, uh, and surety in Christ if you're afraid to talk to a sinner because that's what you were sent here for was to help other people. So um, just relax, take life easy, study to show yourself approved. Christina from Kentucky. I heard you answering the lady to not to turn away from family even though they uh, treat her uh, uncouth because she preaches and tries to help them see the truth. Uh, my mother, whom didn't raise me, has been an alcoholic and a drug addict her whole life. I love her so much when she's sober, but 
she is so full of hate and rage otherwise, is it wrong for me to love her from a distance? No, it isn't. And again, just as I told that lady, okay, um, make a note of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. It tells you how to treat a family member that's ver that is um, uncouth at times. But it is not written that we should convert our whole family into actual truth. Not everybody has eyes to see or ears to hear. But blood is thicker than water and family is family. So, uh, so thank God that you do see the truth and mature whereby... Uh, but by the grace of God, there go I, okay, and have compassion on family. But um, at the same time, there are times you have to set yourself aside. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 states that. Ira from Georgia. A local pastor told me that as an out-of-work widow that I still have to pay my tithes. He says I must give a tenth of whatever I have. Could you please explain this to me? Well, I sure can. If you're out of work, how, what, what, how much is your paycheck? Well, it's zero. So what you want to do is you want to tithe 10% of zero. All right. So what do you owe him as a tithe? Zero. Um, you can tell him Pastor Murray said so. All right. Uh, Janet from North Carolina. My question comes to you with my heart being heavy. Someone I love dearly asked me, how can you know or believe that what you read in the Bible has been changed to deceive you? It has been translated numerous times by man. How can anyone truly claim it to be the truth or the true word of God? How can I explain what I feel, believe, and know to be truth? I've been praying for this person to have an open heart and mind to receive the explanation. Can you help me explain this challenge? Well, I'd be happy to, okay? We have placed by the order of God through Ezra and Nehemiah safeguards on the manuscripts. It's called the Masara. The Masara is a Hebrew word that means to pass something from your mind to someone else without it ever being changed. You that have companion Bibles in Appendix 30, you will have a picture of one page of the Hebrew. It's, it's a chapter in Daniel with the Masera affixed. You can't change God's Word if you apply the Masera, both the small and the large, to it, petite and otherwise, the ma Master Masera, okay? Because it's fixed. Now, uh, this is why you have scholars that have the ability to check these things out. Not everybody has the ability to do that. However, this is one of the reasons I highly recommend the Companion Bible, because Dr. Bullinger was the only Christian that was allowed by Ginsburg to work on the Masera as a proofreader. He was that good. Okay. And... Uh, that Masara locks in the manuscripts where man cannot change it, okay? And uh, it, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So the word is fixed. Now, newer translations, sometimes they get a little woo. That's why I like the standard King James, utilizing the Strong's Concordance to break back to the languages, and you do pretty good, okay? You'll do real good. Um, when, when the scripture is wrong, I call, trans, in the translation, I call attention to it and document how you prove it to be correct. And any good teacher should do that. Uh, Hazel from Oklahoma. We thank you for your teaching God's word. You're welcome. Uh, Brother Arnold, I have a question. I'm 65 years old and I listen to your teaching every day. But I can't seem to remember it. What could I do about this? Well, you're fine. You don't, you, don't, you don't have to remember every verse or word that I say. But the general flow, okay? When you follow the general flow and you must or you wouldn't enjoy the teaching. But that's fine. 
You just thank Father for what you received from it, and uh, you'll do just fine. You remember a lot more of it, in fact, um, if I break it right down to Oklahoma talk, okay, like you're going to remember it, Oklahoma talk. And that's the way you remember it. You, you lock into that, and you'll do just fine. Paul from Oklahoma. My question to you is that uh, is it required for us to learn the song of Moses because I believe you said God's elect would be singing it. Where does the song start and when and stop because the whole chapter seems to run together? Well, it is true. It is written in, in Revelation chapter 15 that those not deceived will sing the song of Moses. The song of Moses, the title is in the last verse of Deuteronomy chapter 31. The song begins with verse 1 of Deuteronomy 32, and it runs through verse 43. It runs through, you don't have to memorize it. Just catch the flow, the teaching in it, and it won't slip away from you. When you get the, when you get the motion or what God is saying, their God is not our God. Their rock is not our rock, and uh, so forth. You won't, you won't forget it. And um, you'll remember, okay? And, and I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all. Really, I do. You know why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you because you enjoy studying His Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. It makes His day. And when you make His day, He's going to make yours. You can count on it. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, when you bless God, He always, always blesses you. You know, um, when you cover His Word every day, and I do mean every day in His Word, is a good day. Even, even if you have trouble, it's still a good day if you're in His Word. Why? Well, it's real simple because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.